Hello and welcome everybody to the Nausea cast. We are back in our regularly scheduled programming now that we've talked about giving our first impressions on uh, the boy and the heron. We're back to the history lesson. We, uh, last time, in our last regular episode, we covered Horus, the Prince of the Sun, the directorial debut of Isao Takahata, uh, the cinematic directorial debut of uh, Isao Takahata. And today we are going to be talking about uh, the next two short films, because they kind of come in a pair, that Isao Takahata directed and worked on alongside Hayao Miyazaki, who had a huge impact on these. We're talking about the 1972 film Panda Kopanda and the 1973 second Panda Kopanda film called Panda Kopanda and the Rainy Day Circus. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of the production history and the, you know, usual analysis of this work a little bit later. Um, but first I want to introduce to you my two co-hosts today. The first is Hipster Cthulhu. What's up? Good to be back in our regularly, regularly scheduled programming. Uh, he, him. As in regularly unscheduled programming. Regularly <laughs> unscheduled, yeah. There's <laughs> a schedule, but doesn't necessarily get met. Irregularly scheduled. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and Platon Skull. Hi, uh, I'm Platon Skull. Pronouns are he, him. Uh, ready for that proto Totoro, bro? Yeah. And I'm Niad, he, him as well. So, where last we left our heroes, uh, we were in 1960. Uh, wait, Horus was 69, right? <laughs> No, 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 no. 68. Six uh, same year as, uh, as the Jungle Book, I think. Yeah, 68. Yeah, 68. Okay. 1968. We kind of talked in our episode about how uh, Takahata and Miyazaki as big boys in the union, in the animators union, were kind of like in trouble, in problems with toy animation. And that honestly didn't get better. Both Takahata and Miyazaki worked on and off on different projects of Toei at this point in time, often, you know, not as the key contributors at this point. And that seems to have been a little bit of dissatisfaction here, which led to, in 1971, Miyazaki, Takahata, and uh, key animator Yoichi Kotabe, who was key animator on Horos and will be animation director on Panda Kopanda, leaving Toei Animations. They were asked to join uh, with their, you know, former mentor and fella, uh, fellow animator Yasuo, Yasuo Otsuka, who was uh, an animator at Toei and worked on Hakujaden, for instance, a movie hugely influential on Miyazaki, which is why Otsuka is sort of a mentor figure to them, but who was also animation director on Horus Prince of the Sun. So they had previously worked together. Otsuka had already left Toei at that point in time to Tokyo Movie Shinsha, a different production firm. And Tokyo Movie Jinsha at that time was working on a new production studio called A Production, uh, which sounds weird, but A Wait, Production so was, Studio. Was it a production or was it a production studio? So um, TMS, Tokyo Movie Jinsha, is the producer, and they created an animation studio called A Production to work on animation features uh, and, and TV series and so on. Wait, so so a production is not a production, but a production studio called a production. Yes, making a production. All right. What what production did they make? So, um, <laughs> good point. Well, I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> yes, I'm glad that you asked. So, uh, Miyazaki, Takahata, and Kotabe were basically asked to join on a pre-production that was in the workings for a Pippi Longstockings adaptation, uh, the an adaptation of the famous children's novel by Swedish author Astrid Lindgren. And let's just start right out of the gate, you know, Platon, you're Danish, of course, like that's probably a big deal in Denmark as well, the Swedish children's uh, story Pippi Longstocking, right? Oh yeah, it's like uh, out all the time in a uh... Uh, when, when I grew up, uh, there, there was a, a live action adaptation at a, uh, at some point in in Swedish. Uh, I can still sing like part, part of the uh, like o opening song for it. Uh, as, as the Lingang is, is pretty huge in much of like uh, the Europe, but especially up north in Scandinavia, you you had some uh, some of it in uh, in Germany as well. I take it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely saw. TV adaptations, movies, whatnot. There were radio dramas, translations, children's books everywhere. I also know the song, just we translated it to German. But I'm curious about the Anglosphere. Yeah. Is like Pippi Longstocking a thing in the Anglosphere, Hipster? 
Yeah, I think Pippi Longstockings is relatively known in like England at the very least. Then again, as a child, I actually went to Sweden a few times, so maybe my perception on that is warped. I don't know if it's very popular in America though, like maybe Canada. You know, that's one of that seems like a country that would like it. But yeah, overall, I think it's not quite as known as it is as like this big entity in Europe. Yeah, and of course, as we knew, um, Miyazaki was part of like the was it like the Children's Literature Society or something in in university. Uh, I think Takahata was also involved in at some point. So, like, they both, we know they're both big fans of, like, actually looking into children's literature and finding a lot of, like, interesting uh, sort of relics from that. And they've always been a big fan of, like, European stories. Um, yeah, right. They for, were. For those Takahata who studied um, French literature. That, that much yeah, yeah, but that's they, true. The two of them were definitely went there to study Because they ended up doing Anne of Green Gables as well, Takahata. So that's. Yeah. Yeah, so an in, in interest in um, in global children's literature, obviously. Yeah. Uh, for, for those unfamiliar with Pippi Longstocking, it's the story about a uh, a like super heroically spunky uh, kid uh, girl who uh, is uh, has like super strength, lives alone with her horse and her monkey, and gets up to shenanigans. Yeah, she basically causes a huge ruckus and she has like superhuman strength or something. All of those fun things. Um, as you mentioned too, um, this this interesting trend of Miyazaki and Takahata ad uh, adapting like European children's novels that kind of starts here and it keeps going honestly throughout their career. I mean, we've mentioned it in numerous episodes where Miyazaki basically takes scripts from or adapts scripts from like British European children's novels. You know, uh, we have uh, Mani was a children's novel. Um, we had um, the uh, Arietti stuff. We had um, um, Kiki is partially adapted in reference. We have the uh, what's what's the Goro Miyazaki? Um, uh, let's see. Well, I see. It's not really a children's story. I meant the new one. Uh, on I mean, Hill? the first one kind of is, but um, the no, new no, one is. Uh, oh, I think I know a... what you mean the woodcutter thing, right? That's Swedish as well, I believe. Um, no, I, mean, I meant the... Why am I blanking on the name? Do you mean Earwig the, and the, the, the Witch? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Earwig I thought you meant the, the CG animated show that Goro also did. Exactly. Yeah, so, Earwig is uh, Diane Wynne-Jones, I believe, as well. Exactly. So we covered a lot of times when that happened. This trend starts real early. It starts right here with the plan to make a Pippi Longstockings movie. And in line with that, you know, pre-production phase, uh, Miyazaki, extremely excited, starts drawing sketches, scribbling notes, uh, developing settings, drawing backgrounds, character designs, all of that. He has everything ready and he travels to Sweden. There in Sweden, his production team says, oh, well, we haven't actually talked to Astrid Lindgren yet, who, you know, who needs to give the green light for this project. Uh, let's see if we can get her to meet you. Well, Astrid Lindgren, not knowing who Hayao Miyazaki is in 1972, uh, and we're not surprised that she didn't know, uh, said no. Uh, she didn't meet with them. Um, it's not exactly made clear why, but I guess it's just the idea that her story to be animated wasn't something that she was really into at the time. Later in the 90s, she would greenlight a Canadian uh, animated production. And after having seen it, it is said that she didn't like it. <laughs> so I suppose uh, Astrid Lindgren, maybe not uh, the most um, open-minded about the medium of animation in her day. Um, and maybe for good reason when it comes to the adaptation she didn't like. But I guess it's hindsight is twenty twenty, And we probably could assume that a Miyazaki adaptation might have changed her mind a little bit, but it never happened. Yeah, I mean, it's it's no big surprise when you when you really like like looking back today, like you say, hindsight is twenty twenty. That's like a big like oh, what could have been, but like from Astalinkan and her like publisher's perspective, like imagine if uh, some like let, let's say like a Peruvian animation director just flew to England to talk with, like, J.K. Rowling and ha hadn't set up a meeting and someone asked, like, J.K. Rowling, hey, there's this Peruvian animator who you've never heard about. You barely even know if that country has an animation industry at all mm. and they want to adapt your work. And it's like, uh, I'll pass, I think. I, I, I get that. Like, it's, it's that sort of vibe because, I mean, it took until, like, the 1980s before 
a lot of people in the West were even like aware of uh, of Japanese animation as like a an actual cultural force and not just a local uh, niche industry. Well, kind of, but you know, there is the seventies is where the first Western uh, Japanese collaborative projects start. I know, for example, that Germany has licensed uh, uh, a couple of Japanese studios in the 70s to make multiple children's TV series that were very beloved in German TV in the 70s already. And also the world masterpiece theater trends starts start emerging. So basically anime adaptations of famous works of world literature, of children's literature and so on, among which uh, different Miyazaki and Takahata contributions were also reemerged. So we're like right at the heyday of the West realizing, you know, animation could adapt our classic literature. But I think this one is just a little bit too early. 1972, this might be, or 1971 is when they traveled. This might just be a little too, uh, too early and too futile an effort at this point in time. Um, this point still standing, uh, Miyazaki was crushed and disappointed that uh, his uh, adaptation of Happy Longstocking, Longstocking could not happen. And instead of throwing away all of the designs, which, by the way, in 2014, there was a book released in Japan, The Phantom Pippi Longstocking is the title of the book, which is a compilation of all the sketches and drawings and designs uh, they made at that point in time. Instead of throwing all of these designs away, um, they decided to reuse a lot of the work in another work. And that work is Panda Copanda, which we will be talking about today. Uh, everything, including how Mimiko is this spunky little red-haired girl with like two, uh, two thick braids, that's already exactly the design they had chosen for Pippi Longstocking, as is evident from that book of sketches and designs. So she she does not have long stockings though uh, to uh, <laughs> to avoid any <laughs> any legal trouble I guess exactly that's the uh, one yeah. detail they changed. In, Maybe short in, uh, actually the uh, some of the research you posted Nyard, um, there was a great quote from a uh, Raz Greenberg who sort of summarized Pippi's character and I feel like it's sort of influential to a lot of the way Miyazaki constructs his sort of movies and particularly we see his very like spunky like uh, female protagonist throughout his movies because it's. The quote is, um, Pippi's mission is to expose the hypocrisy and absurdity of the adult world, an eternal child who never grows up and represents idyllic realms of childhood contrasted against the grimness of a well-ordered adult society. Uh, and as we talked about in like things like a por Porca Rosso, like the sort of idea of this sort of like childish sort of removed world contrasted against the sort of ugly realities of an adult world something that's always sort of captured Miyazaki's work. Uh, and I think this is a very, like, Panic of Panda is a very interesting iteration of an early version of this sort of thinking and of this sort of a uh, narrative structure. Right, except the adult world is not that ugly uh, in, in this movie. Everything well, yeah, in, in this one, it, 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 this is far more of like a, a child-centric sort of story. It feels like it's one made for children. And I think later on, Miyazaki would evolve into sort of writing stories that are for children but have these of uh, adult like un ideas to them that are like sort of layered in but speaking of adult productions and this is a really interesting point because immediately after being refused it's not like they immediately started working on panda copanda instead they were offered to work on another property that will make a recurrence uh, in this podcast later uh lupin the third part one it's an adaptation of the famous monkey punch manga lupin the third and well, the anime is likely a lot more famous in the West, and it is very famous in the West, incidentally, with many odd cases. I know, for example, Italy is all about Lupin, and they always uh, translate every season immediately. But also America, Germany, and so on, all had their own dubs and uh, airings of the old Lupin the Third series, a very legendary old-school anime series. And, well, Miyazaki and Takahata partially, and we'll get to that, partially directed the first season of it. Um, the original director of the first season at A Production was Masaaki Osumi. And uh, I have seen the, the the first season, I think, Hips the Earth as well, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty rough, pretty <laughs> pretty uh, spotty production all around. Yeah, it's a spotty production and also, goddamn, those first episodes were really, really dark. Like, the Monkey Punch manga is 
a lot more adult than the sort of playful and adventurous vibe that Lupin often gets in many adaptations. But it was really grim, like just Lupin killing people just like that and, you know, dark shit happening all the time, uh, murder, sexual violence, all of it. And, you know, because the ratings for the TV show were really bad at the time, uh, Tokyo Movie Shinsha actually tried to get rid of the original director, Masaki Osumi. Uh, they first told him, hey, please change some things about the script. This is not okay. We don't want this. He refused to, so he got booted off the project. And the, you know, just recent hires, Miyazaki and Takahata, were co-directors starting at roughly episode 10 but they were already contributing before that to different episode directions. And it's remarkable that within this short, I think it's just 23 episode series, you see a extreme shift of style and tone and characterization, even in like the visual design of the characters. For example, Fuji Komina, the, the femme fatale, a sidekick to Lupin, shifts from, you know, long haired and usually in sexually exploitative situations, uh, half exposed to now she has shorter hair she's more of a collaborator to Lupin than like an evil femme fatale or like you know she she got a substantial um let's say uh child friendliness boost yeah, <laughs> that's the best way makeover. to summarize it what do you say uh, like a makeover yeah, of, she, of the character. She got a makeover, but that's not the only case. Basically the entire Lupin series shifted from uh these dark uh, much more adult themed although I want to say like immaturely adult themed it was definitely like often I felt the first like eight or so episodes were often done pretty tastelessly it wasn't very good afterwards it turned into like a fun heist hijinks kind of series and I think that's more of the kind of style that Lupin is nowadays known for but enough on that so they immediately got moved onto that project but after that was done you know we'll talk more about Lupin when we get to the first movie Miyazaki directed for the theaters, which is Lupin the Third, Castle of Cagliostro. Ah, you see, connection, narrative, perfect. After that project concluded, then they were basically given a green light to revisit their old Pippi Longstockings project, but like not as Pippi Longstockings, but as like make a new thing. And that turned into Panda Copanda, which... Interesting here, the second second big part of the history is uh, the release of Panda Copanda, the first and the second, coincided with an interesting panda craze in Japan because as part of panda diplomacy in 1972, um, the uh, Ueno Zoo received a gift of two pandas from Mao Zedong. And I think they got them on, on, a, on lease. Uh, it wasn't a, a, a gift. It, I, I tried to verify that because on Wikipedia it said, it, it said Lee's, but I verified that those pandas stayed in that zoo for the next 50 years and had children. And it was a gift, I think. Another right, source that, that, I found said it right. was a gift. And in general, I found the Wikipedia article to have quite a few uh, contradictions. For example, they said that Panda Copanda, or rather implied that Panda Copanda was made in reply to the panda craze but i would rather get into that it's just an interesting coincidence because the pre-planning with the pandas and everything was already done before the gift of pandas was actually received but it's worth bringing up because especially the second episode of panda Copanda was in the middle of that craze and it really was a craze but before we get into that maybe just a word on panda diplomacy for those who don't know it's an interesting foreign policy fun fun fact it's like a chinese um, strategy of diplomacy or I mean not really strategy it's like a symbolic act where when they have good diplomatic relations with a country they will gift them uh, uh, pandas for, for zoos right in 1972 as well President Nixon visited China and Mao Zedong gifted him uh, two great pandas as well so the idea was to symbolize the growing relationship between China and the United States and also China and Japan with a gift to Japan in the same year um, through this exchange of pandas. Pandas being like sort of this symbol of, of China and, you know, also, Everybody loves pandas. Everybody loves pandas. And the Japanese people really, really loved pandas. So the two pandas that Ueno Zoo received led to a craze where the annual numbers of the zoo, which stood around 4 million before the uh, arrival of the pandas, inflated to 9.2 million in 1973. So the numbers more than doubled. That's... Yeah, I, I remember like a few yeah. years ago, um, I, it must have been before COVID at least, uh, when 
couple pandas got to the Copenhagen Zoo, and that was like a whole diplomatic situation as well. Uh, big, big, big news in in Denmark, like a, a big deal. I, I think it also did a lot of uh, for for the for the zoo's uh, visit, visitor numbers. Well. Interesting. Well, it seems the panda craze is a universal phenomenon. Um, I just remember that Berlin had like an ice bear craze uh, a while back, like I think 15 years back. There was like an ice bear baby and everyone loved it. You mean polar bear? I Polar bear, yes. Ice, ice. Yeah, that's the English word. <laughs> uh, yeah, the German word is ice bear. So I just... Yeah, same, same in Danish. Yeah. I just translated it literally and that, that's wrong. That's silly. Silly me. Anyways, uh, that was the uh, polar bear Knut, and he was cute, and everyone was crazy for him, and uh, yeah, people flooded the zoos. There's something about bears which seems to do this in general, although here we have panda bears. Okay, so, so much for panda diplomacy. We can now get into a little bit more about uh, Panda Copanda. So it was a production, uh, two short films. The way I understood it, it wasn't really stated clearly anywhere, but basically that the first film was made, then a second film was made, and after that it was cancelled, in quotation marks, as in it might have developed into a TV series if it had been more popular. At least that's what I uh, read. Uh, Miyazaki basically said, uh, and I quote, we talked about what we would do if we got to make a third or fourth episode. Should we do this or that? But we only got to the second one. We couldn't make more than that, so I made... Totoro later so in reference to having made Totoro much later um, and he said well it wasn't like I wanted to recreate Panda but I wanted to make a movie for children properly so what we have here is a kind of relationship Panda ko Panda is the first time where Miyazaki explicitly and Miyazaki and Takahara in that case explicitly go out of their way to make a work dedicated for children which they would only in that pure form later repeat again with Totoro and with the same kind of motivation so keep that lineage in mind. We have a couple of more connections uh, uh, maybe to mention. I was here. also going to say, in reference to that, to get into a, a sort of a, an interesting personal note I picked up, um, just reading, like, the again, the Wikipedia summaries, um, Miyazaki uh, had his uh, first son, Goro, we all know and love. Uh, he was born about, like, five years before Panda Panda was born. Um, in production, and I believe from something I read that Miyazaki, uh, his wife, who was another animator, like eventually just uh, stayed fully at home with uh, Goro, so he was more absent. And like as we know, that's been a uh, a thing that's brought up multiple times in Miyazaki's career, and he's admitted himself that he was a very sort of absent father and like more concerned with working. And so it's interesting that he uh, made these like explicitly for children's movies at the exact time that uh, he would have like been seeing his family a lot less yeah i think he well, reflects I, I can on imagine that. it's also yeah. uh, that might be part of the motivation for making a children's story would be making something for your little kid uh, I, I can see that also yeah um Miyazaki, I think, is in starting point, kind of reflects on his role as a, as a father, and he considers himself like a failure as a father, but he, like, he made movies for children. He kind of ponders the irony of that, you know, that he makes movies for children, but ultimately ends up, you know, not being a great father for his own family because he's not, never really at home. I think it's probably fair to assume that uh, when he's making these movies for children and he has as much uh, he's also thinking of his son and incidentally his son was also at the initial premiere airings of these panda ko panda shorts and uh, i think it was reported that little goro did enjoy them so <laughs> there's that um because these two both were released in subsequent years at the Toho Champions Festival, which uh, is a is a is a you know film festival which had a children's section. So uh, on Wikipedia it says that um, the Panda ko Panda shorts respectively aired and the as as shorts as previews before Godzilla movies. That's not quite accurate from what I can find looking at the Toho Champion Festival of 1972 and 1973. That it's a lineup of films and Panda ko Panda was in the lineup of films alongside Godzilla films in. Uh, uh, 1972 alongside Godzilla the Great Blitz Operation and 1973 Godzilla vs. Megalon. It did air on the same festival at the same theater, but it's not like there was some weird contract where, you know, Panda ko Panda would, was chosen to be aired before Godzilla just to clear up that uh, weird little piece of trivia. 
Um, speaking of Godzilla, so one of the things that inspired Miyazaki to write Panda Kapanda the way that he did is that he was, um, well, let's let's take Godzilla, right? Like classic monster movies, B-movies, loud action, silly, uh, you know, rubber suits, fighting, and so on. That was kind of what Godzilla was in the 60s, 70s. Um, and Miyazaki comments on it like this. He says, at the time, I thought that children like flashy, noisy films. But we thought that fun and excitement are best found in small moments of everyday life. We made Panda Ko Panda in the hope it would be something children would be, would enjoy. And after airing it alongside the Godzilla movie, I recall feeling very happy at the sight of those children. And I think it was because of the support of those children that I decided to do the kind of work that I do from then on. So it seems like one of the major things that re started really early on in Miyazaki's career here is, let's compare it to horrors, right? It's a classic fantasy hero story. You slay the big bad, you have a giant, you have all this action, you have fighting wolves. Panda Ko Panda is more in line with the style of Miyazaki works that aren't big action epics, but the small, minute, everyday life activities that we are more familiar with. And it does seem that making Panda Ko Panda at a time where, you know, it was aired alongside Godzilla films and seeing that the children also enjoyed it and that, it, that, that this kind of moved him to pursue this kind of film more. And I think that's quite remarkable because, you know, it's a bit daring at a time when you expect them to, you know, want to see Ultraman or Godzilla and whatnot, that the children might appreciate something as calm, and everyday life focused as, you know, Panda Ko Panda. Right. I think at the top here, it's worth noting that uh, Miyazaki is credited as the writer, while uh, Takahata is the director yeah. of, the, of the shorts. Uh, but we are talking about it, it mostly in context of Miyazaki's career. Um, and, so, and to some degree, that's because, like, being the writer and, like, uh, being the main drive behind the uh, attempted Pippi Longstocking uh, adaptation means that he's very, very like central to what the story is. But also, um, it's it's the 1970s. It's, it's a small production studio, animation studio. So the roles probably were much less like uh, partitioned than, yeah. uh, than they would be later. So, so it's, uh, yeah. Isao Takahata is the director. Hayao Miyazaki is credited as writer, layout, scene design. So basically, he also wrote the storyboards. Um, Yoichi Kotabe is credited as animation director. And Yasuo Otsuka is also credited as animation director and character designer. Though we also know that Miyazaki did a bunch of the character designs. So uh, it's, it's all kind of a mess. But as you said, yeah, 70s anime productions tended to be like that. Uh, another person um, who worked on uh, uh, Lupin the Third as well as the two panda films is Yoshifumi Kondo, who we might remember from the Whisper of the Heart episode. He would become a frequent collaborator of Takahata Miyazaki, working on Anne of Green Gables, Grave of Fireflies, and later directing Whisper of the Heart before tragically dying, um, well, from overwork, basically, in 1998. Um, very tragic that... Listen to our Whisper of the Heart episode for more context on Yoshifumi Kondo, but this is where their collaboration begins. Okay, shall we get into Panda Ko Panda? So maybe a little bit of a recap. What 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 is it? What's the story about? What's happening? Well, it's 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 very short. It's two uh, episodes of like a, around a half hour each, give or take. Um, and it's it's about uh, Mimiko, uh, PP short stockings, uh, as we've established. Um, very uh, very independent girl. We learned this from uh, three people she meets at the very start of the first episode, saying, "Wow, she's so independent! Wow, she's so independent! Wow, she is so independent!" Her grandma has just uh, left uh, left town for, uh, I believe it's uh, her, some a funeral. The grandfather. Um, uh, funeral or something yeah and uh and she uh, and mimiko does not have any uh, parents uh, she uh, lives alone but she's so independent as we learn uh also uh, extremely spunky and excitable uh and when a, a little uh, stuffed toy size uh, baby panda uh, and it's uh, totoro sized uh, panda dad arrive at the little house uh she she lives in uh and admires the like 
a bamboo uh, grove outside. Uh, she decides that uh, they are now going to be a family, and uh, and the panda is going to be Papa Panda, and the kid is going to be a, a Panchan, uh, or I, Panny is what the subtitles I had translated him as. I think we'll talk, refer to them as as, as Panchan and uh, and Papa Panda. Does does that uh, is that cool? Papa, Papa. Yeah, great, great little, great little song uh, to, to open up. <laughs> Uh, and so they like play house basically uh, for a bit, um, uh, going around, uh, and then uh, e- eventually it turns out that uh, the the pandas have escaped from a zoo, and uh, and the uh, zookeeper director is like looking for them, and the local policeman uh, f- finds out what's happening and uh, alerts people. There's some shenanigans with like the, the uh, Panchan uh, going to the school and trying to like uh, stay hidden. Um, yeah, that's still the first by, episode, I believe. Yeah, yeah so this, this is all the first episode. Um, by by the end end of the episode, um, Panchan uh, goes missing for a while, um, and uh, turns out it's just like chilling, uh, sitting on a log, floating down the river, and. Um, Mimiko and uh, and Papa Panda uh, save the uh, save the little baby panda uh, from falling down a, like a, a waterfall, a, a floodgate, and uh, and everyone's happy. And now uh, Papa Panda doesn't just go back to the zoo, but uh, the zoo becomes like his job because all dads need to, you know they go to work every day. That's that's part of playing house. Um, Damn, you know. And everyone's very happy. Reading that that's the last first episode. Bit? In the context of Miyazaki, you know, being an absent father because he's so oh, much yeah, at work, of... it's like kind of coping. <laughs> really, yeah, really interesting. Hey, little Goro, um, papas are supposed to be at work, don't you know? <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah, I think it's interesting that um, we have this sort of absentee parents or father thing at this very beginning because it's um, part of the Pippi Longstocking story, but also it would become like a repeated thing throughout a lot of Miyazaki's work, obviously. Like the parents are usually away, or they're sort of not that interested. Like in Ponyo or in uh, um, Totoro, the the dad is you know concerned doing his stuff, and the kids go off to play somewhere else. So this idea of children being sort of left on their own uh, and having to sort of like make do with that, like become adults in their own sort of way and understand the world, is yeah, I think, a I think Laputa, theme he's always touched on. Laputa is another great example. Yeah, of yeah. that. The independent kids just living on their own uh, with like a town community to help them, but still, yeah. Episode two, but then. um, yeah. So ep- episode two uh, is uh, this time. There's a, a little baby tiger that's um, that's escaped from uh, from the circus instead of the zoo, um, and uh, a couple of circus guys uh, sort of like uh, looking for this tiger. They break into uh, to the house. But are scared away by the uh, by the big scary uh, pup panda, who is, of course isn't actually that scary. He's just nice, um, and uh, and Mimiko is very excited because she's never seen a burglar before. How exciting! Um, it turns out the tiger was actually in like in the house and was like using uh, Panchan's stuff, um, and so they befriend the the little tiger and have a have a bit of fun uh, until uh, Mimiko realizes that oh it's uh the the circus is missing their like little tiger cub um and uh, and she goes to the circus and turns out that uh that the little tiger and uh panchen both ran off to the uh, the circus she uh basically de- makes what looks like a hostage exchange from afar uh trading panchen for uh, for uh, the little tiger who I, in the subtitles was called Tiny, but I believe it's called uh, uh, Tora Chan. Yeah. Is that right? Tora, just yeah. Tora Chan. Yeah, just I Tora. love that scene. It was very like a Wild West showdown. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> yeah, everyone was Fun really scared way. because the the tiger looks a lot more like realistic than the panda, um, but everything's fine because it's it's a it's a kids uh, kids film, um, and uh, and everyone is very happy. Uh, and then uh, that night, there's a there's a big big uh, like uh, flood uh, because like a heavy rainstorm. Um, and in the morning, everything is like 
not just flooded, but like fantastically flooded. Uh, think the uh, that sequence in Ponyo, which uh, pretty much calls back to this uh, sequence, and uh, they, uh, but they, so they have fun on the like roof of the house uh, until they get like a little message, uh, message not in a bottle but in a like circus ball that the circus is in danger. So they sail over to the. Uh, towards the uh, the circus and figure out that uh, the circus animals are all stuck on a train that's halfway underwater. But they get the train, uh, like, they get to the train, they break the animals out, uh, but before they can, like, start, like, paddling them away or whatever, the uh, the train starts because of uh, hijinks, you know, comic comical hijinks. And uh, the train just keeps going, goes, like, becomes a runaway train, like not just on the tracks, but then goes off the tracks and just all the way into town before uh, Papa uh, Panda just stops it with his like Herculean strength, and everyone's happy. The end. Uh, that's pretty much the end of both episodes. Uh, everyone cheers. Everyone's happy. Here we have the emergence of another Miyazaki theme. The everyone being happy. Yes. Uh, no, the importance of natural catastrophe. And the consequences of brave children fending it off. True, but also uh, people being happy and cute things being cute. Exactly. And the animals need to be freed and, you know, eco-terrorism. <laughs> yeah, like the symbiosis between like sort of nature, like these wild animals and also like living alongside these sort of uh, pastoral sort of humans is a... Uh, Almost like very Mononoke uh, in the end, where it's like the, the panda goes and works at a job, but he's still sort of free uh, to like live his own life. That uh, that sort of theme. Uh, I, I don't know how much the movie like really properly reflects on it, but like this theme theme of like nature being misunderstood or treating as hostile, needing to be like confined to a zoo or like a circus, and all the adults when they first see the father panda, like a freak out and are scared of him, even though the Mimi Kogan clearly see that he's perfectly friendly and harmless. Sort of the idea that like children can uh, can see that more like a uh, yeah. sort of like tr the 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 truth of life, like the the, the way to live, almost uh, free of these uh, societal expectations better. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it also sort of runs into the uh, like kids movie weird uh, like fridge logic of hang on a second. These animals can talk. At least some of them can talk. Uh, and it seems the adults can speak with them. But the adults still instinctually treat animals like people would treat animals in real life. Uh, so that's a bit strange. But, you know, that's that's part of the course for, for this type of genre. Yeah, I like that. It's it's almost like the, the animals can talk, but it's only the children that listen, in, in essence. I guess, I guess oh, that's, that's, that's a good, good way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I also think like it's it, we can't overstate like the similarities this has to later works because only because of the hindsight that we know what Miyazaki would do later in Totoro, in Mononoke Hime, in Ponyo, do we actually assign so much value to what is happening on screen in Panda Copanda? Because honestly, standing on its own, there is mostly a lot of emphasis on it being a fun thing for children and maybe Miyazaki yeah. espousing some of the values in the writing, you know, um, that he holds. But aside from that, I think we would be going too far to actually, you know, my joke was kind of, oh, natural catastrophe. Well, that's a huge theme in Miyazaki works later on, but here it's kind of like a set piece, I think, right? Like that's at yeah, least my it's, vibe it's for the movie. It's a fun little here. thing, fun little thing, a bit of everyday excitement that gets exaggerated to uh, to some pseudo fantastical level because you know some kids might remember like oh when, when a dark storm is happening out there and there's this little scene where uh mimiko who's who's like she has like adopted the papa panda as her dad obviously but also kind of adopted uh, panchan to be her like son yeah which is a weird dynamic but but never she's more of like big sister type I have she, a note on that that's interesting yeah. because at one point in the first episode, because she promises her grandma to write a letter every day and in one night she dictates, well, she says the letter out loud as she's writing it. She's writing something like, hello, grandma, I'm fine. I have a daddy now and I'm also a mother. Thank you. Yeah, whatever. Uh... whatever. 
<laughs> not what you want to hear from and me. And gra- like gra- six gra- you just left the letter. Like, what the fuck is going on, Mimiko? <laughs> yeah, outside of a obvious Freudian reading, I think it, uh, yeah, the movie operates on that sort of, again, childish logic of, like you said earlier, playing house in which, yeah. you know, yeah, having the, the papa figure for her is obviously important. You know, the absentee sort of parents in her life, but also that wish to, like, play the role of the mother as she understands, you know, society expects of her. So there's sort of this uh, childish interpretation of how a family works. Yeah, but the, the reason I was getting into that was because during the, like, night where the, where the big storm is happening, there's this little scene where uh, Panchan is, like, really scared, uh, not very comfortable with the storm outside, and uh, and Mimiko just goes and uh, to, uh, to, to comfort him. And... That's just a sweet little moment that's like kids in the audience might recognize from their own lives. Um, just a little bit of everyday uh, anxiety that might happen, uh, a little bit, bit of everyday drama, and then like exaggerated the following morning as the not not just are uh, things flooded, but like the landscape has changed uh, in a in, in a very fun way where you can go fishing from the roof. Uh, so like that fantastical thing. And yeah, I, I am very much like on the side that sometimes a silly little fun kids film is just a silly little silly little uh, fun kids film, uh, and a lot of the like thematic stuff and depth and all that is much more like retrospective when we know the places that uh, Takahata and Miyazaki went with some of these ideas and images later on. Um, yeah. It's kind of like trying to. Uh, do the same in-depth analysis of like old Mickey Mouse cartoons compared to like Snow White. Like it's it's just compared it doesn't really Mickey, yeah. it's not really the same ballpark they're working in. Now why uh, exactly does Mickey though, bully the mean cat in this yeah. one? I think I'm reading some class dynamics here. I've been seeing a lot of Steamboat uh, Willie edits that I said Mickey saying pretty controversial stuff. <laughs> um yeah, but uh, I will say though that uh, actually from the production, I agree that like we see a sort of uh, future of uh, how they would sort of uh, go about their animation style, and it really reinforces, yeah, this sort of simple, uh, childish sort of view of the world. Because um, first of all, I really love the backgrounds. I just want to yeah. really get out there oh, yeah. about the backgrounds here. Pastel They're color, specifically, no outlines. Yeah, yeah, no thin. outlines. Like no, not even thin lines. Like everything is just color on color, which is like very storybook like. It makes everything seem so much more idyllic, and even the um, the placing of it is like obviously Mizaki loves his pseudo European sort of styles. A lot of the houses look uh, like wooden, sort of almost late Victorian. But then some of the stuff is obviously modern Japanese stuff, like the trains, the little policeman station that is like one of those tiny little box houses. The bamboo grove. Uh, yeah, the bamboo grove, obviously. So it's this very like mixed, no real fixed time or place sort of setting that allows it to be, you know, uh, again, like a like a story, like an imagined space. Yeah, that's uh, and then another thing that returns with later uh, Studio Ghibli works. This yeah, like ambiguously like pseudo European and Japanese yeah. setting. Um, and then on top of that, I would say the animation like really sticks out as well as being like really like physical because, uh, as we'd see in both Miyazaki and Takahata's work going forward, they really like try to understand like movement of the animation of the characters as sort of real, not like real people, but like realistically portraying these fantastical people, like the way that the the baby panda can like fall like 20 feet on his head and be fine because he just like bounces a little as he falls but like everything about the animation of the bouncing is like real you know if that makes sense yeah like, uh, yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot the, of the like, way the space is treated yeah there's, there's not there's, there's a weight to to the animation which is a very like uh uh as i understand it a, a surprisingly tricky thing to convey um and uh, I, th- I think especially of like the sequences at the start of the f- like first episode where the uh, where especially the the uh, Papa Panda is just has a hard time uh, be- because everything like chairs break beneath his weight and uh, and like it, it, that's the thing that keeps coming up that uh, that the world isn't like made for like this big uh, heavy uh, bouncy guy. Um, and it's, it's little detail that, uh, uh that I, I think like brings a sense of like reality to all the fantastical nonsense. 
Um, yeah. it's, 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 it's kind of delightful, like not, not, not in an extreme way, but in a way that I could absolutely understand that like, uh, five to eight year olds in, in the audience at this like cinema festival, it was first shown at, uh, were like really, uh, engaged with, uh, with the animation. I think it's also worth comparing to contemporary TV animation because uh, this definitely doesn't have like cinematic or theatrical budgets. It's short films, but they are not, they're more in line with like TV productions. But stunning quality compared to contemporaries. Like let's take Lupin the Third, uh, the, the, the series part one. That's a rough series, man. That's just like tons of extremely limited animation, tons of animation errors, bizarre, like choppy movements, even though Miyazaki and Takahata were working on it. This one, in terms of, you know, comparing it to even the greats of the 70s, of the early 70s, I should say, late 70s is another uh, can of worms entirely. That's very different. The animation industry developed a lot between uh, early 70s and late 70s in terms of TV animation quality. But man... This looks really good for the time um, in terms of what was produced, not for theaters, but like for, you know, TV or smaller scale productions. Well, even uh, compared to some movies that were coming out in, uh, this year, I would definitely say it's it's, it's still pretty uh, high quality. Yeah, I think it's interesting you, you bring up Lupin because it's sort of almost like a, I wonder if it was almost a turning point in both their careers where Takahata and Miyazaki uh, both favored these far more simplistic um, again, storybook designs, very like basic character designs with like not usually a whole lot of features on the face or the the body, but allowed them to like animate better, allowed them to like be more realistic in their movement and the the expression of them, as opposed to something like Lupin, where you have these very rough characters, a lot of thick lines, a lot of like movement on the face, but then they come off looking like quite janky, quite sort of a, a not quite a human, you know, a bit skeletal. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I think the secret sauce here is how consistent it is throughout. Um, like you, uh, you you mentioned Lupin the Third and and it having a lot of uh, production issues, but it's not that the that Panda Commander doesn't have like limited animation techniques thrown in. Yeah, they're just thrown in really smartly uh, in a way that. Uh, it keeps like a consistent fidelity level throughout the uh, throughout the whole work, um, which just balances uh, it all out. And then you compare it to um, uh, Prince Horus, where you have these incredible sequences, and then sometimes you just go into slideshow mode because they ran out of budget. Yeah, that, that kind of thing. I, I think it's a really well, well produced, um, like a uh, couple of short films. I think. Definitely. And, you know, you can tell lots of the same people uh, worked on this as they did on Lupin the Third, especially the human characters. They're basically, I mean, basically penned by the same character designer, period. That, yeah, that's that basically is... it. You can see it in their face shapes, in their teeth, in, their, in the way they deform when they have, like, facial expressions. Very Lupin the Third, season one. Yeah, Just speaking of, uh, good looking. there's a moment, <laughs> there's the crowd shot, uh, oh, which, yeah. uh, which Hipster, you, uh, you, you, you made note of, right? Yeah, the, in, in there's a big crowd shot at the end of the first episode, and we see two guys who clearly look like Lupin and Jigan just standing in the crowd, sort of as a, as a little cameo. Yep, yeah, that's uh, the and, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and the look of that crowd shot is like really interesting because it's this panning shot across a crowd of very distinctly drawn characters, which makes me think that there are other references in that shot that we might not recognize or might just be inside jokes for for the animators or something. Yeah, true. I mean, the, I definitely see like a couple of character uh, characters here might be references to other animators and collaborators and movies, uh, but I'm, I'm not feeling confident enough about any of them to directly point them out. Though I am pretty sure the, the guy... Uh, there, there, there's a Bruce Lee in there as well. <laughs> I mean, I think I spot him. Uh, anyways, there is definitely a lot going on there. But yeah, the uh, the animation overall, uh, really like nice and consistent, well produced, uh, good good backgrounds. One one thing I noticed was that while while the story does have the storyboarding does have this sense of place that. Uh, Miyazaki is very known for like the interior of the house is very like 
you see people walking into the hallway, up the stairs, into the room, uh, stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, the uh, like the realism of the backgrounds is much like less um, than than you would see in a lot of uh, Ghibli works later on. Like the house itself is built; it, it has these like really skewed angles and this like uh, absurdly uh, sharply uh, pitched roof. Uh, that that just it it has the storybook quality when you look at it uh, from a distance, where in later Ghibli works you would uh, you you have these like lovingly rendered like realistically proportioned backgrounds uh, and the fantastical is like around that goes on top of that but uh, but here like uh, even like the buildings are exaggerated. Uh, also, a little thing I just noticed now: uh, the mayor, right at the beginning of the first one, is he's driving the the Totoro car, the little uh, front one wheeled front uh, fan thing, the little dinky thing that they bundle all their stuff in to move. Neat. Yeah, <laughs> Miyazaki always loves dinky little cars, typically European. Oh yeah, uh, it does. and of course, like we said, he goes on to give Lupin the iconic Fiat Five Hundred. Which we will uh, definitely cover cause it, more. Because it's better when he drives tiny little cars as opposed to big, ugly ones. Yeah, that, we'll get into all of that when we get to Castle oh, yeah, of yeah, Cagliostro. Well. That's probably going to be very important for that movie to talk about all yeah, the changes. There's, there's, basically, like there's basically like a, a moral spectrum of uh, transportation vehicles in, uh, mm -hmm. in Miyazaki's work. Like on the one end, you have like enormous machines which are scary and bad and don't. And on the other uh, side, you have like the dinkiest little uh, scrap heap you've ever seen, and that is always fun and wholesome and nice. Yeah, like shitty airplanes you got to repair yourself, good. Bicycles, yeah. good. Little yeah. shitty cars, good. Everything else, no. B big ugly factories are bad, but weird dumb factories like Howl's Moving Castle that's all janky <laughs> and falling apart is cool, yeah. and then it learns to fly, of course, like you said. <laughs> No, 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 like th that, that confirms my theory because at the yeah. start of the film, the big hulking house castle is like weird and, and scary. But by the end, when it like just falls apart into this dinky little rackety, uh, cute little thing, that's when everything is much like uh, nicer and we get the resolution and everyone is in a happier place. The Miyazaki spectrum of uh, morality in transportation vehicles. Uh, and, yeah. Trademarking it now. It begins Yeah, we well, can get it in the second part as well with the, the train. The train the itself is paper. like unbelievably tiny and also just can like drive like a car apparently. <laughs> yeah, the circus train, that, that whole sequence is just absolutely silly, but like very, very fun. Um, I was going to say my, my last thought on the... My last thought on the production is just um, that uh, I think it's interesting that you said, like, in Lupin, uh, there was, like, a lot of trouble. The, the studio uh, uh, not produced it very well, and they needed to come in and sort of, like, finish it up, and it still looked quite janky. And with this, you're right, like, in the consistency is really what, like, makes uh, Panda Cup Panda shine and make it so fun, because there's no points where anything doesn't look great, doesn't look, uh, like, really stellar. I wonder if that also like really shaped uh, Miyazaki and Takahata's standards because they're both two like notoriously perfectionist guys who want to make their movies like never look bad for a second. They always have these very precise visions, uh, and all the animation and background art has to always like coincide with that. And obviously, to sometimes the detriment of their staff, like they they always decided to make films that are like absolutely precise. Uh, because maybe uh, their early history in Toei seeing like very incompetent sort of productions. Yeah, yeah, I, I can absolutely see that, and and also you, you don't become a, uh, you you don't get a successful animation studio, and uh, you don't become directors with a lot of sway if you can't work within the limitations of the studios, and uh, and and I think you can sort of see this with the experience they've had with uh, with horrors like falling apart in various ways um, with, uh, with with Lupin uh, and, and their experience in the animation industry and then coming out on the other side uh, with especially with Toshio Suzuki like ho like holding their feet to the fire 
just having a respect for uh, the production process, um, which like you you don't get like a consistent output if you keep being over budget uh, and like uh, past all uh, goddamn deadlines. Uh, you you need to be able to make things in a way that makes the people you work for happy as well. Yeah, though Toshio Suzuki does not enter the frame uh, until Nausicaa. Yes, uh, he doesn't get into the picture until Studio Ghibli starts becoming a thing. Uh, but I, I think that partnership is so essential to uh, Studio Ghibli. And we can see here, like, partly why because what um because the impression we got from horrors was of these really impressive sequences that were that were like wildly ahead of their time for uh, the late 60s but also this jankiness and this uh inconsistency within that production that sort of like throws people for a loop and what we're talking about with Panda Copanda is, well, it's not the most impressive, uh, coolest animation ever, but it is throughout very consistent and very delightful. And that is, I think, commercially and in the long run, a better like thing, a healthier thing. Yeah, definitely. So... Are we about ready to get into our short thematic analysis on Panda Copanda? So, Hipster, you mentioned earlier Raz Greenberg and that chapter uh, or that paper um, that, 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 that was written in large part about Panda Copanda and Totoro. And you mentioned uh, how that paper characterizes uh, Pippi Longstocking. The interesting thing here is that this paper uses the characterization of Pippi Longstocking to contrast against how Kimiko in Panda Copanda actually does behave ultimately. Namely, it says as much as um, how Pippi was basically revealing the absurdity of the adult world, always causing a ruckus, basically being a very independent but like against the adult world child, if that makes any sense. Uh, the phrasing is a bit awkward, but that's roughly what it's about. But how Kimiko in Panda Copanda rather than being really such a troublemaker against the adult world, is honestly in the first two of these shorts primarily recreating the adult world because, you know, while her grandma is away and she's supposed to take care of things, she's shown to be cooking, cleaning, hanging up clothes, you know, she's taking responsibility for the house. She even takes on the motherly duties. So what we see here is like a encounter zone where the independent Miyazaki girls aren't actually troublemakers. They're actually really self-sufficient mini-adults who, you know, incidentally happen to um, have strong family values. Yeah, you know, that's definitely happening in this first one of the two shots. And I think that's kind of what um, Raz Greenberg is talking about in terms of how the transformation from P.P. Longstocking to Kimiko happens. Uh, Mimiko. Sorry, what is it, Kimiko or Mimiko? Mimiko. Mimiko, okay, well, I, I messed that up a few times. Anyways. You can remember it because she is a mimic of Pippi Longstocking. True, good good mnemonic device. I, I bring that up mainly because I know some of our friends and co-collaborators on this episode weren't really interested in participating on a Panda Copanda episode because I, I think they have a bit of a few hard feelings about what the first episode does uh, here, especially with the whole making house thing, with the you know traditional family structure, with the role of the father, the role of the mother, and the role of you know yeah. the children. Uh, there's also like yeah, lines to, to in clear, there, she, like it's easy for a father to be a father, but a mother can't be a father. Like weird lines. Like let's just say our queer hmm. friends found some scenes scenes not very uh, good. Not very good, I think, is what they would say. <laughs> no, no, I get that, and, and there's that like sort of conservative aesthetic to it, especially when she's like, uh, "Oh, a a father wears a hat and smokes pipe." Yeah, and that's even like the the little insanely catchy opening song um which uh, also has some lyrics about like oh mom mommy and her flowers and daddy and his pipe 
and that's like again i i think that might that that sort of reminds me of like the some of my weird feelings about my neighbors the yamadas yeah uh with tagahada later this sense that like oh the family structure is like has this naturality to it this uh essential like quality that uh that that mimiko like is she's not wrong in saying these things it's just silly that it's a panda uh i think it's like the message of the of the movie that like it expects all the kids to be like oh yes of course that's how families work yep yeah i think it, i think it's sort of halfway there because like we said we can look back and reflect in a the way that Miyazaki would eventually sort of uh, take on these themes and maybe analyze and critique them a bit more in his later work. But yeah, if we really look, just look at Panda Panda by itself, it definitely is a pretty uh, traditionalistic, pretty, you know, nuclear family pilled. Um, but uh, again, I do think there is a little something in me that finds like the charm of the absurdity to sort of reveal something, at least a little simmering under the surface where it's like, yeah, um, like I said earlier, with the uh, the childish aspect of it, where like the adults treat the panda as a as a monster, but then he can just like come into society fine, like he can fulfill the role of a father, and it's like sort of the child can see that uh, Mimiko can see that he's capable of this role, even though he's sort of like thought of as just this wild beast by everyone else. That like there's this sort of um, idyllic child, t- childish understanding of a family, but that doesn't like lessen it. It's sort of almost a purer form of just wanting this sort of bond with other people, and it yeah. doesn't really matter who they are. You can sort of, you know, make your family of who you wish, and they'll love you still. So I mean, th- there's 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 a little bit to that. It's not exactly you know the blood ties that we would assume with a more like conservative view of family, where if they're not related to you, they're not your family. Yeah, that that is a found family thing here. But I think also like trying to like begin to criticize like gender dynamics and stuff through this is it that, that's like it, it it's doing the thing where kids they play house that's like one of the main games they like enjoy playing uh and like why do they do that well it's it's a familiar social structure and it's like something once you realize you can imagine it and recreate it and and play with it that's something kids find fun and I, I don't think there's anything like particularly like iffy about just making a story where a kid playing house is a kid who happens to not have to be living alone without any parents. And when a fun creature shows up, in this case, a panda, choosing to play house with it and it playing along, that sounds fun. That sounds like a lot of like little kids would be like wildly into that. I, I don't think it gets like it, it's that complicated. Uh, at the at the end of the day, you know, mm, certainly. Um, I I think it's just I mean, worth unless, mentioning. Like, playing house is a complicated thing. I, well, I guess you, you could com- complicate it that way, but I, I'm not a like child psychologist. I I mean either, you know, but probably be. An, I bet we can find papers where it's like, oh yeah, playing house, like the way uh, playing house culturally reinforces whatever. Um, I think there might be some value to you know, parents and uh, educators and artists critically reflecting on how we teach children how the world works, you know, the kind of inherent structures like family and so on, and to make an effort to create that more inclusively, but I'm not blaming a 1972 children's short film for not doing that. It's just worth bringing up, I think, especially with a progressive band podcast like we are. Yeah, I think the worst thing you could say about it really is that it's just very sort of status quo-y for the time. Like, it's it's like, yeah, this ideal thing where kids want to play house and be cool and independent and go on adventures, but still have like a, a mama and a papa role, which is like, yeah, I guess I guess it could, it could be saying worse things. Yeah, and also like, it's like, sure, um, it kind of de-radicalizes Pippi Longstocking, you know, because we know the Pippi Longstocking DNA is here in the paper makes yeah, the she's point. She's explicitly anti-adult. No adults allowed. Yeah, exactly. And this is, she's just become a little adult to show and, you know, she's pretty responsible. The other adults are kind of like just goofy people. They're basically as goofy as, like, Papa Panda is. All of the adults. Yeah. I, I, will, I will give her this, though. Uh, she does uh, complain that the policeman is extremely rude. 
uh, all cops are rude. Uh, quote uh, from Mimiko. Well, there's actually something I was thinking about as well. Um, I think uh, we, again, we mentioned like the animation and the physicality of it. I do think there is meant to be a core to this character where she is this little adult, but she also has like the childish exuberance that like maybe Miyazaki himself, even though he was relatively young when making this, was still, you know, the ideas of of wanting that inner child to stay alive. There's a theme throughout quite a lot of Studio Ghibli's work. Um, that like she still stays pretty you know naive about about the world, but things just happen to work out because it's this very idyllic sort of setting. Even um, I was still trying to wonder why they would do this other than it being just sort of silly. But when she constantly does like the weird like handstand Y pose and flashes the audience multiple times, like to me that is almost like this really silly thing of like this childish like almost like lack of shame and this also athleticism the fact that she can just do it all the time and like she like jumps on her head and stuff but then when papa panda does it he always falls over or like even baby panda does it but uh, he has to like struggle to learn how to do it he's not quite got that uh sort of that young uh soul yet he's still like a baby i think it also has to do with like how pippi longstocking is known to lift her horse and stuff like that to show how strong she is. I think the handstand is just like the analogous thing because we don't have a mm, horse. Yeah, to that's lift. true. There was no horse here. Yeah. It also clearly demonstrates in. that yeah. her stockings aren't that long. Yeah. So so Zero don't stockings. sue. <laughs> no, no. Uh, seriously, it, it also um, kind of uh, another thing that keeps coming back with Miyazaki. Uh, these little kids, uh, like their skirts flipping up and showing their bloomers. That's that's another thing that will return a lot. I think we've uh, talked yeah, about this in another episode. From Totoro. Yeah. And uh, to be clear, her bloomers are extremely visible. Hmm. Like it's, it's many times. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I, I again, I do feel that's very intentional. Where it's like, yeah, it's this this lack of shame, this like childish, uh, f- being freed from not having to like worry about stuff like that. It's like a very um, it's a thing children are like. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think people like. Uh, being uncomfortable with that—that that, that's their problem, honestly. That's that—that's the place I've landed on. Yes, but also Miyazaki, uh, famous the inventor of the panty shot. I think we've <laughs> resolved this matter now. <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think the whole reason why it's cool here is because those aren't panties. Yes, yes. true. <laughs> They're kids. Um, but yeah, the. Uh, one weird scene, I think, I, I really want to mention. I think I forgot to mention it in, in the like, uh, um, in like the uh, plot summary. Um, so late in the first episode, when people are out looking for the pandas, uh, and uh, Mimiko goes like is out on a little little trip, little picnic trip with uh, the, the pandas. And they and they do like a, a bit of skipping um, uh, with this with a skipping rope, and then a couple of kids come along and they're like, "Ooh, that's the panda everyone's looking for," and one of them has a really aggressive dog, like the type of dog that I think kids in the audience are meant to be scared of, um, which is the only like time aside from maybe like the the tiger uh for a bit in the second episode that where like animals are like not good you know not good to be around Mm -hmm. and then once it starts being threatening it turns out that panchan is not just a panda cup but a super panda cup with a head resistant (laughs) to bites and a like sort of super strength that never comes up again absolutely not yeah, we, we that's such a strange scene to me. We we can we can uh, put that on the list of plot inconsistencies. <laughs> but Ding! Yeah, so. <laughs> I think it's just about the idea. Oh no, we're scared for Panchan, and then oh no, Panchan is fine because he's super strong. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it it's just weird because I feel like it it's out of a bit out of place. But I I do appreciate what it's doing because it's a kid's story and. Kids should be allowed to. There needs to be a little bit, just a little bit of conflict, you know, as as a treat. Yeah. Like the like the. It's similar to how we talked about with with like my neighbor Totoro, where 
everything's fine, everything's going to be fine, and the whole vibe is very calming, but there is room for, like, being a bit scared, being a bit sad, being, uh, like, uh, things being a bit uncertain. Uh, and there's another thing that, like, returns in, in Totoro, this, like, at the end of the first episode has this brief sequence where we don't know where Panchan is, and it's a bit concerning, but it, it it's nothing extreme, and he's quickly found. Um, so it, it it does have these like elements and this um, this respect for the, for the uh, for the child audience that uh, I think only goes like get stronger uh, later on. Yeah. Um, well, it's also just a fundamental thing of like a story needs just a little tension to it. Like if if these were all just idyllic scenes, it'd probably still be quite fun, but like wouldn't quite as hit. You wouldn't quite get the satisfaction at the end of things working out and having a happy little uh, ending, having a, having a little prologue. Also, I love the scene where the panda gets on the train and squishes people in. Uh, pandas commuting is a pretty, just a good idea all around. Yeah, I I think like we everyone and us included talk about this as like the uh like yeah the the, the proto totoro like the warm up for for that uh and i think one thing that totoro does much better is the big fluffy guy does not talk and that yeah. i think that's like the the key difference that really makes totoro so much more iconic and interesting because i think that like papa panda is just a, I don't know, a, a bit too pedagogical a bit, a bit too like like he doesn't really have anything interesting to say i guess that there's there's less magic to it in that the way I bamboo think. growth are nice too oh yeah um yeah I, I agree and papa panda definitely looks like like a kind of totoro right like he has the face the big white smile uh, the shape you know there the does this exact jump when they're skipping rope that's the exact like animation the jump the totoro does so it's definitely easy to see how the design of papa panda is like present in the totoro development totoro lineage as well as basically the core ideas uh, of like as miyazaki himself said that panda ka panda was kind of the thing he was trying to do again with totoro just like as a movie and as a really good movie at that, whereas uh, Panaka Panda, if it wasn't attached to a name like Miyazaki's, I don't think I it would stand out to me as really remarkable. To be honest, that's kind of my assessment here at this point in time. But being part of this career, I think it does have its historic value and with that historic intrigue. Yeah, I it, it's not something I would have watched otherwise, Like aside from the historical value to it. And uh, and we talk about like the animation is uh, not impressive but solid and consistent and maybe like a, a probably a bit ahead of the curve for uh, for that decade, um, but that's like for the, for the like animation uh, like like re like really like animation otaku will be able to like point out exactly what is or isn't impressive and uh, I'm I'm not that well versed in it. So uh, I thought it was pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, it is neat. <laughs> neat. Um, it might have been something I, I would have watched if it, if it wasn't Miyazaki. I, I do like going back to some stuff from like the uh, the seventies and sixties. And yeah, this is a particularly, like we said, consistent, like really great looking. Uh, yeah, like this. This is not This isn't like a all time classic, but it is the type of thing that if like some grandparents had like a dubbed version on a VHS somewhere where, when I grew up and it was put on it would be like an entertaining thing that you like remember later like oh right that like with with the talking panda and that circus train i remember the train like that sort of vibe uh is and i think that's exactly the type of thing they were actually going for so uh you know they met, met their goals yeah and i surprisingly don't have much to add uh talking for example about the second episode with the flood and the circus train and so on like we kind of touched on a number of the motifs that recur later in the career like the relationship to nature catastrophe like the flood and how playfully uh she engages the flood despite you know kind of like how it happens in ponyo where it's like um not that much of a catastrophe because like brave children weather the catastrophe super well with lots of excitement and joy um 
but aside from that, I don't actually feel like I have much left to say about it. So maybe you two no, I, still I have, think, but I'm I'm I like think the only good observation we haven't mentioned yet is uh, that it does a like direct reference to Goldilocks in the second. Oh episode. yeah, the Goldilocks routine. That's just a really funny scene. Yeah, they all but, have but, but, like, sort of reverse that are <laughs> very yeah. different sizes as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the first thing that it, that happens there is like the circus uh, folks. I don't know if it's the circus director and his assistant, or something, but two folks from the circus um, who who have broken in, and one of them is like, "Hang on, something's wrong here. This chair is so big. This spoon and this plate are so big. Who would need such a thing? Something really big." And they're getting more and more scared uh, until until they get frightened and and leave when the uh, when the whole family comes home. And then it does the Goldilocks thing again, but the other, but more directly this time, where Panchan realizes, "Hang on, someone ate my, uh, my food. Someone has uh, like slept in my bed, uh, stuff like that." And it turns out to be uh, uh, like a Tora, the the little tiger. Yeah. And that's just a neat little reference to a classic fairy tale, and I don't really have anything to say about that um on thematics i would say there's one thing we sort of touched on there's one sort of interesting parallel but um uh, it's interesting how they kind of both times both movies directly sort of address like humans relationship to animals like having a panda and having a tiger they're sort of like confined by this circus by this zoo and there's sort of like this theme that we said would be worked on sort of reminiscent in um for Takahara, um, Pompoko yeah. as well, like because the because the ending of Pompoko is very similar, where it's like the animals just basically learn to be human. They like that's the only way they can sort of make it. They they have to learn to to fit into human society the way they want it. Otherwise, they just can be treated as like you know an other, an exterior thing yeah. that can be just sort of conquered. Yeah, the so thing it's, is, it's not some... quite as um, slightly bleak like it is in Pompoko, but like the ending of Panda Panda with the uh, Papa Panda being a, a salary man now at the zoo like he's learned he, he can work at the zoo he can sell his labor to the zoo instead of just being kept in a cage <laughs> which is yeah. again slightly it's almost a little dark joke for for the audience yeah i think that's something a little, silly. a little strange is how like the neither the zoo nor the circus are like condemned for their like them like having these animals in like enclosures uh, the, the, like the, the circus folks are like uh, like chewed out for not getting all the animals away from the flood, but it's not like the problem is the circus's treatment of the animals in and of itself. It's just that they should be more okay with the animals just walking around and escaping, and also like all the adults like want almost hunting for the pandas, but like the conflict resolves without like really addressing like that prejudice for lack of a better word it's but i th I think it's mostly just you know kids movie plot hole bullshit that only it's just it's part of the course it's the genre yeah i think it's also interesting that um like we said uh being a proto totoro um the the totoro would of course be like this spirit it's a much more like abstract idea he's like the spirit of a tree he's like this forest troll gremlin man that isn't like doesn't have to sort of clash with the realities of like what if he was just a a, a bear that was in the woods that befriended these children there's so many more like implications about yeah our relationship yeah. to wildlife but totoro is sort of free decision... of that by being sort of a spirit almost yeah. Also, the story decision of the kids not imposing anything onto like the like Totoro and and those like animals. They don't want Totoro to live with them in that way. They just accept Totoro for what what he is, uh, which I think is a, a much more magical like thing. It, it's much more. I, I think it's also better for like the kids' imaginations, like watching it. It's much easier to imagine that there is a weird Totoro out there in the forests that they might meet one day. Than it is to say like, oh, a big talking panda is going to be a dad. It's it's <laughs> that's a harder sell. Um, yeah, one uh, one little bit of background characterization that I really appreciate, um, and uh, that I noticed I had to like uh, 
like like uh, r- run run the footage back and like pause at the exact right frame um because uh, Mimiko is shit at maths um which makes <laughs> sense because like she she's she's pr- probably pretty good at Japanese she writes detailed letters to her grandma um but she it was i, I think it was maths she wasn't listening in like probably no, no that, that, it wasn't it. It was story time, whatever. But anyway, my point is, there's a scene where she is doing her math homework while Papa Panda's sitting asleep. And the she got the first one right, which is four plus three equals seven. And then, like, after, like, looking up at this, like, sleeping uh, Papa Panda and smiling, she looks down at her paper, sees three plus two, and writes six. Beautiful. What an idiot. Beautiful. Three plus two is five. Luckily, it's only there for like one frame, so kids won't be like learn bad math lessons. It would have been really funny if she got interrupted during the maths class. That would have been a great callback. Yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah. I, I think it was, it was story. It was time like probably Japanese goes. class, right? They were just reading yeah. from a book. Yeah, story time. So yeah, uh, two plus three equals five. Uh, Mimiko, get your shit together. That's the kind of analysis people come to this podcast for. Exactly. Knowing that <laughs> 2 plus 3 equals 5. Quick maths. And that's also a perfect conclusion to our analysis of Panda Copanda, I think. 3 plus 2 equals 6. Um, <clears throat> no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, what did I just tell you? <laughs> Listen, I trust uh, Miyazaki that he knows his shit. When he puts something in a movie, why would he lie? I mean... Anyways, <laughs> let's wrap this up, shall we? Yeah, I, I mean, what what really is there at the start of the day and at the end of the day to say about Panda Copanda that isn't just a bunch of stuff to say about the people who made it and the things that they later on would make, such as, uh, <laughs> I yeah, I I think I think there's just not a lot to it, and that's that's okay. That's the type of work Panda Copanda is. It set out to do this thing, entertain kids, be like fun and silly and delightful and cartoonish. And it did that. It did that pretty well. I'm sure a lot of kids had fun with it. Um, But, I mean, the most interesting stuff about it is all the stuff that it isn't. The fact that it it isn't a Pippi Longstocking adaptation, uh, despite Miyazaki's best futile efforts... The fact that it isn't Totoro quite yet. The fact that the like big fun little flooding scene isn't Ponyo yet. Uh, the fact that the little uh, Ghibli girl isn't quite the uh, uh, the Ghibli girls we meet later yet. Um, and in that way, I, I think there's a certain like value to discussing these sorts of works in like, greater depth and about themes and stuff. But at some point, it, it, it gets a bit silly. Yeah. Uh, and and we, we, we get a bit silly in this podcast sometimes, um, but not probably, probably not too much to uh, read into this work. Um, but a lot of animators out there right now making this sort of work, just making decently well-produced uh, stuff that will entertain kids and is decently well-animated and consistent and... and they will maybe go on to do great things and we will look back on some random little few episodes uh, series they did on Nickelodeon or something and say, holy crap, all of this like started here. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a fun thought. Definitely. It is definitely a fun thought to see the humble beginnings of such legends who will soon become of international renown because... Between now, Panda Copanda in 1973, and the next movie we will be talking about, because remember, we are primarily focusing on movies with occasional exceptions for short films or like two short films in the case of Panda Copanda. Um, they will, the next movie that we'll be talking about is 1979's uh, Lupin III Castle of Cagliostro. It will mark the cinematic directorial debut of Hayao Miyazaki. But in between then, both uh, Miyazaki and Takahata often together worked on a number of television series, uh, some of which became super fucking popular and uh, internationally renowned. For example, Heidi, Girl of the Alps, which would be made by them. 
just the very next year, 1974. And Heidi Girl of the Alps really was kind of the their, their breaking, breakout success, right? Like it was a precursor to the World Masterpiece Theatre stuff, which they would also keep contributing to that I mentioned earlier, like the adaptation of classic world literature. And also um, it gained it gained international notoriety for, you know, its various depths in Spanish TV, German, Italian, Arabic, South African, various English versions, India, Turkey, and so on. Like it immediately, it's like, I think the first work that actually got international recognition was Heidi, Girl of the Alps. But we won't be talking about a 50 plus episode TV series. That's just how we decided to run this format. But it's also worth noting that other than Heidi, also Miyazaki's first, you know, TV direction, Future by Conan ad in between, and Takahata's incredible Anne of Green Gables adaptation, which uh, is an absolute masterpiece alongside, of course, Future by Conan and Heidi Girl of the Alps, which are also great shows. Um, this kind of uh, uh, Anne of Green Gables adaptation really also fits within the framework of, you know, a potential Pippi Longstockings, uh, Pippi Longstockings adaptation, as in taking famous, especially uh, uh, literature, especially focused on young girls and their independence, their creativity, their, you know, um, shenanigans being kids. And Anne of Green Gables certainly fits in that style. So having mentioned all of these and that they're all great, important, influential and of international reputation, it primes us to be excited for when we talk about Lupin III, Castle of Cagliostro, to continue our little journey down this historical rabbit hole. And with that, I want to first uh, remind you that we have a Patreon on patreon.com slash narcicast with double A. And we have a Discord channel as well. Make sure to check that out in the description. And aside from that, you can listen to this podcast anywhere you can find podcasts. You can also subscribe to the channel on YouTube if you want to see a little nice uh, visualized version of this. And we are uh, excited and looking forward to uh, hearing from you, seeing your comments, uh, and hope you'll be with us for the next episode. With that, bye-bye, everybody. Yep. That Goodbye. Was, uh... That was all from uh, a Proto Totoro production, a uh, production by a production studio called A Productions. Thank you, Platon. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>